Over to Julie. Dream of a dress. Dresses are dreams. The dream of someone you could become. To find that perfect dress is to bridge the gap from the impossible to the possible. Hopes are interwoven with the fabric, the colour, the cut, the feel. There is magic in that right combination. To buy the perfect dress is actually to buy a dream. As you fit yourself into it, as fabric covers your skin, the dream becomes a closer reality, a hop rather than a mountain to climb. You can leave all the dross behind, the insecurities, the knowledge that actually you don't know what you're doing, the cellulite, the dread, so that for that short time, you are the very best version of yourself that you can be. And you finally have sanctuary from your worst self, the bleating, harping, doomsayer part of you. A dress can make the difference between not doing anything and making that leap from who you fear you are to who you want to be. I knew it was an extravagance. I knew that it was an over-the-top gesture, which was tantamount to forcing your hand. You will not back out, make excuses, carry on as usual. Okay, you didn't ask me to do this. If I'd asked you beforehand, you would have said an outright unequivocal no. And true, I have been pushing you on bit by bit along this entire path. Well, I don't care. I've watched you in the stale air, doing nothing apart from, you know, breathing. God knows what revolving endlessly in your mind. You just can't freeze over, become stagnant stay indoors, live your whole life on a, on a, on a postage stamp. Because, because there are too many people who actually care about you. Me, Rufus the cat, uh, Peter, our elderly neighbour, Mrs Chan from the post office. And what about all those people you used to work with? Rian and, and Susie and Brenda. Look, I don't care that they haven't been in touch haven't been to see you late, late recently, because you know why that is anyway. Last time they asked you out, you said no. They insisted, you said okay. And then you didn't turn up, ignored their calls. They have decided to leave you be to work through whatever it is you need to work through. But, you know, serious, seriously, Mum, it's been long enough. What has it been, four and a half years since we lost him? Notice that I said we, because, you know, I lost him too. He was my dad, you know. Only that, you know, I don't say this, because I know it'll only make you worse. You have a hard enough time dealing with your own grief, never mind my grief also. But look, don't worry. One day I will be able to tell you that Francis' mum was, was there for me when you just couldn't be. But you know, I, I don't resent you for it because of what losing dad has done to you. In a way, it's a pity that it was such a large payout because it means you can actually afford to just sit there in the stale air forever. If he died of something natural rather than the very unnatural crane that fell on him, then you would have to have gone back to work. And look, I, I know it sounds mean, but quite frankly, I think it would have been for the best.
As it happens, nobody knows how to help you. Mostly because you've given everybody all the reason in the world to believe that you're okay. I mean, I've seen you. I've stood next to you while you pretend that everything is fine. I know you. I know when you're pretending to be interested in other people's lives. Pretending that all is well. I have no idea why they just can't see how empty your words is, what words are. That awful look in your eyes. When I suggested that online dating site, I remember, even if you have chosen to forget, I remember that spark I saw in you. To be honest with you, I only suggested it as a joke because, you know, some person in college was saying that their dad had started using Second Chance and was having fun. I didn't think you would have fun, of course. <laughs> I would never associate that word with you. Not anymore. I just mentioned it because I was at my wit's end, sitting there eating dinner, the two of us in silence again. I just blurted it out without even thinking or planning about it beforehand. And there it was, I saw it on your face, the briefest of smile, but a real one. Perhaps some part of you can acknowledge that you are just plain lonely. You must be. You don't connect with anybody anymore. Apart from perhaps Rufus, you know, our cat, who's delighted that you're there for him full time in the house. I have moved on. The world has moved on. You simply have to as well. I will simply not leave you here to rot. So then, the profile we created, well, I created it for you. I knew I was pushing you into something you'd prefer really not to do. Well, tough. This isn't a preference situation. This is a must-do situation. So, with me sat beside you, more or less directing your fingers onto the keypad, you responded to a couple of men. Mike, and then John, was it? Well, it was like wading through treacle. But then Gus turned up great name Gus and an architect Gus the architect perfect for you but anyway I then discovered you'd actually been responding to him on his on your own without me I just knew we were making progress so when I was coming home from the library past Debenhams I just had to go in because they had a sale on not that I bought it in the sale mind you I saw it Green background, beautiful flowers, slim fit, just the perfect cut for you, Mum. And I just bought it. So with much cajoling and arguing, you actually agreed to meet him. Glory be. In that new bistro in town. Hallelujah. And that evening, I could see you were going to back out, weren't you? I could see it in that blank look in your eyes, the strain in your face. So I forced you to put your dressing gown on while I ran the bath. And then I presented the dress to you. I showed you how perfect your pearl necklace and your dark grey heels would go with it. And oh my God, what did I see in your face? I'll tell you what, utter dismay. Because now you will have to go. You look so lovely in that dress, Mum. Just lovely and perfect for an evening at La Bistro with Gus the architect. All you had to do was have a good night, a pleasant evening. But did you? No, of course not. I didn't like the look of him, Claire, you said. He was at least 10 years older than he was in the photo. He wore a short sleeved shirt and, 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 and a tie, and not in a trendy way. I'm sorry is what you said. And then when I asked you where the hell you had been, you know, I was furious because I had genuinely thought you'd been back to the grave again, in the dark with your heels on. But no, you had ended up bumping into Max's dad. I, I vaguely remember Max from school. God only knows who his dad is. 
you met him at the bus stop. I mean, this dress was not made for bus stops. And you had a drink with him in the Batten Ball of all places. When I bought that dress, it's not what I had in mind. A lemonade with some electrician in a grimy pub. I don't know whether I'm furious or glad that you didn't take your coat off. I mean, the Batten Ball is such a dive, full of old men. You'd be finishing off a few of them with that dress. I can't believe this Max's dad actually took you there. Anyway, maybe you seem to be a bit happier texting a bit more than usual. Or perhaps it's just that I've given up thinking that I could fix things for you. I guess I've learnt my lesson. You can't just come up with a dream, buy a dress and give it to someone else for them to fulfil. I'm going to have to stick with my living my dream for my own life from now on. Well, I suppose the dress isn't being totally wasted because you're off with Max's dad to some work stew of his with all those electricians. Sounds riveting. And we'll wear the dress then. Well, good luck with that.